Fuck. Man, I've had a tough week, Cole. I'm here to tell you. Yeah, what's going on, John? Open up. Uh, Share your feelings with me. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, that's what I love about you. Is you're you're a deep feelings kind of a guy. Okay, let's move on to another topic. I've had enough. <laughs> Uh, ah, it's been a good week, actually. You know, it's a, every any week's a good week. I, mean, I was processing more and more of my uh, Palouse images and uh, mm. really enjoyed. We had really good group out there, super group. And there's nothing better than when you have a good cohesive group who, who, as I like to say, brings their good time with them. So we had a really good. Group. Now you've been there many times. Did you come home with anything that you felt was a good image that you loved? I think I have three or four. Yeah. Oh, I mean, nice. it, it goes back to uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about, you know, keeper ratio again. I, I don't know. I'd have to go look. I think I have, well, I have to divide that by two. I have about 20 images in my JPEG folder at this point that I would consider posting to an Instagram feed, which is a lot, right? So, but that, so those are, I would say good images of, of those worthy of that type of sharing, but uh, your printable images, maybe three or four. You know, we both have areas that we go back to frequently, uh, you because you're a workshop leader, me uh, of my own choice, but it, it's sometimes difficult. I've been going to Death Valley for more than 50 years, yeah, yeah. so it is sometimes hard to see something new. Not that it's not there, right. but it's hard in our head or the Oregon Coast uh, working on a single project over 15 years now. Uh, it is harder and harder. And, so, you know, you go there with an expectation. You'd like to see something new, but I find myself often going to the same spots and shooting the same scene over, maybe hoping to improve it. Totally. Yeah, I relate to that 100%. Yeah, trying to find maybe quite a little bit better light or a better cloud or whatever. Alabama hills are one where I find myself going to the same rocks. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that penis the expectations. Rock. It's a good topic because we pick a location because we either, unfortunately, have seen other people's work and want to go there and try to recreate it, or we've bought a guidebook, which, <laughs> or for whatever reason, we want to go there. We have expectations. And is that a good thing? Or is it a bad thing? Or is it Ooh. just what is? Boy, I I have a pretty visceral reaction to expectations. I, to me, they are death. I mean, they're deadly. They're killers. They, to me, it's the opposite of how I want to show up, mm. but I do it. I, don't get me wrong, Cole. I, I fall into that death trap so easily. I'm going to go to Alabama Hills again. Right. And my expectation is I'm finally going to get that great sky to go with that composition I've been seeing for the last 20 years. But boy, that totally, what I've learned and the reason that expectations I feel are so deadly is that totally shuts down any other opportunity mm. for something other than what I've come for. And to the point where, it, I mean, I well, here's the story. We went, it was a foggy, foggy day. We're going to, what was that called? The 59th Street Pier or whatever it was down in Ocean City area. Cape May, and there's an old abandoned pier and it's falling apart. It's a great scene to go photograph, but it was almost socked in fog. Everybody else said, uh oh, well, wasn't what we were hoping for. Let's go to breakfast. And I was like, what? Why are we going to breakfast? And I ended up making one of my all time favorite images that morning. So, you know, if I had had that same attitude of it's not what I was expecting, and I know what the expectation was killer sunrise we're up at 3 30 in the morning and i want color beyond color in the sky and killer sunrise well that did not happen for sure we had fog but i got this really ethereal and i moved my camera image motion blur or intentional camera move whatever you want to call it and i adore that photograph it's in mm. so i think i think um expectations can really really get in the way of the creative process well, there's your thoughts? two types of expectations. Sometimes I'll say in my newsletter, I'm heading to the Faroe Islands and people will say, oh, I can't wait to see what you come home with. So you start saying, oh, my gosh, I'm supposed yeah. to come home with something now to impress other people. That's a very hard one. And then there's the expectations you put on yourself. Uh, when I went to Ukraine, I think I've told the story. I, I am day three into the journey 
yeah. and I haven't seen anything. So I start really getting upset because I've got, I've got, you know, nine days left, eight days left, yeah. seven days left. I've got to get something. Yeah. And that really is a, a buzz kill. It kills the creative process. You just really have to let go and say, if it is going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. I not, I don't, shouldn't have any expectations of what it should be. And truthfully, if I don't come home with at least one good image, I should have a wonderful time there. Yeah. And that is worth a lot too. Oh my gosh. That's worth a ton. You know, the experience of having been in the Faroe Islands and yeah, we, it's nice to have a, um, you know, an image that you would, could represent that experience and you'll certainly have something, but you know, that, that wall hanger, but you're right. I mean, we're in the Faroe Islands, you know, I mean, that's what the experience should be, but you know, we, we can kind of bring into this discussion, something we touched on briefly and that idea of amateur versus professional, you just said it, you know, a little while ago, we talked about it in last week's episode, you know, I said, if I remember in that episode, I said some of the effect of add to the quagmire, if you will, of this expectations that I am a professional mm -hmm. photographer. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So, so what is professional amateur? What, is, what does that mean in your mind? Well, tr traditionally, professional has meant you earn your living from it. And I've heard it defined as that you earn at least 50% of your living from yeah. doing that. Yeah. Uh, but in our society, it tends to mean he did a professional job. He did an amateur job. Right. It, it, it tends to mean quality. Yes. Well, the original word of amateur from the Latin means you're doing it because you love it. You're not trained in it. Uh, it's your passion. Yeah. And so I'm proud to be an amateur. I don't yeah. earn a living from it and I don't have training in it. And I do it because I love it. Yeah. And to me, I agree. The, the only reason I'm professional is because I, well, we've established I've only got one good photograph. So it's not my Well, yes. So clearly it's not the quality. Right. Yes. So, but it is because I actually make money and I make money not because I sell images because I only have one good. You know what? I should just try to sell that one good image though. <laughs> Let's just see if I can make money from that one good image. Well, if you have an edition of one, you might get someone to buy it. Edition of one? Wow, <laughs> that big? <laughs> yeah, but you're right. But there are times where I do feel that pressure, mm. you know, that expectation, if you will, to, to be able to find a good scene. Even when I'm with workshop students, we arrive at a location and they're saying to me, so what are you seeing here? You know, I feel like... Yeah. I, well, yeah. of course I do. What are you seeing? What are you attracted? I do that whole thing. But then ultimately I feel somewhat compelled to say, well, I like this over here. This is, and this is why, because that's part of what they're paying for, obviously. But, but yeah, there is pressure that goes along with uh, expectations and professional versus amateur. I'd rather be amateur all day long because I feel like it, it relieves some of that pressure. Yeah. I, I really love being an amateur because there's so little pressure that way. Um, yeah. I'm not trying to earn a living. Um, I don't have to produce every week. Uh, to me, the worst job in the world would be where you had to produce every week certain types or product images or something. Oh, my gosh. Uh, boy. I take can't fun imagine. Out. You know what? I, I'm going to get permission. Ricky Cook, again, a 20-some-odd-year National Geographic guy whose home we use over in Molokai, Hawaii, um, to do the contemplative photography retreat. He's got a writing that in my mind is probably one of the most um, important pieces of writing that's been written about photography and the process of how we show it. It's, it's phenomenal. And I want to get his permission to maybe share that one day with this audience and then maybe have a discussion and about that. Uh, cause I, cause he's a, he's a very deep thinker and a brilliant guy and a brilliant photographer. And, and it's about some of these things that you and I like to talk about too. So, but anyways, back, back to, um, you know, expectations. Um, you know, I like that you brought up the fact, cause I really hadn't thought about that. I'm thinking about expectations with really solely with regard to what's there. And I'm expecting fog at Sparks Lane in, in, uh, Cave Cove. You know, because I've seen John's image of that beautiful fog. And what do you do if there's no fog? You know, that's where I think it gets in the way. But I love that you brought up the idea of the expectations that we put on ourselves to even just create a good photograph. That's 
that's a little deeper than just hoping that there's fog and what do you do if there's not fog so that, that's going to get me to well, kind of noodle for a little bit you have a different pressure than i do like say you're a professional you're out there with a group of people who are expecting something from you yeah uh, maybe that's why those other workshop leaders who point people's camera for them so they you know feel like the guy gave them something yeah. they can come home with that one image yeah yeah, that would be hard for me to do because it just goes against what you and I believe so strongly about, about personal vision. And I feel like the best gift that I can give somebody in a workshop is to encourage them, <laughs> dare I say, give them permission <laughs> or have them give themselves permission to finally follow that vision that they all have. You and I have talked about yeah. that. You know, They all have it. They just haven't tapped into it yet or thought deeply about it enough. To find well, out. they're too busy following rules and following other people's <laughs> vision. And it, those yeah. things are vision killers. So you just can't find your vision if you're following other people's. Hey, make a, make a note about this. I love in one of your lectures, you talk about vision blinders. Blockers, yeah. Blockers, rather. Vision blockers. So, a matter of fact, I'm going to write that down now because if I don't, we'll forget about it. Vision blockers. Because I think that discussion would be really good. What are so we've talked briefly about what vision is, but are there vision blockers? And obviously, we've just revealed one. You know, expectations certainly can be one, but your list is much more specific, and I think really good. So let let's bring that up in a future conversation. Hey, before we leave, you know, I bought a sweater the other day, and, and it was it full say? of static electricity. So I returned it, and they gave me a new one free of yeah. charge. <laughs> seriously did you get this from your grandson no for my grandson okay well, oh, free of charge running out All of right. things to say talk to you soon <laughs>